that the essence of Islam applies to 24 hours of the day and it has more meaning for us in terms of the outcomes or objectives of our own lives. But of course, we have allowed ourselves to come into the mosque and come into a different world, come into a religious function, come into a different world, then we go back outside and we carry on with the rat race. Do you know what the rat race is? Do you use that term in Guyana? Yeah, true enough. Just, uh, just, I'm still in Guyana, <laughs> in Guyanese time. Yeah, you know what rat race is, don't you? Yes. Everyone know? Yeah. I, I don't know whether you know, you need to respond to me. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I have ears, but they're not good. <laughs> then I'm like, Mike, does anyone know what the rat race is? Oh, yes. Right. The problem is, wherever you go and wherever you are in the rat race, whether you're here or whether you're there, you're still a rat. And you go back to that rat race, and life is just a machine. And you switch on in the morning and switch off in the evening. Yesterday you were a child, and then you were a teenager, and then you grew up, and now you've got white hair. And you think, where did my life go? What have I been doing all my life? There's actually really no purpose to our life. We're just living like machines. And then we have problems. And all we do with our problems is we firefight. Today is this problem, let's deal with it. Tomorrow is another problem, let's deal with it. But we don't st stand back and think, what's actually all going on here? Is there anyone in this room who chose their date of birth? Is there? No. Come on, I'm getting really worried now. No. No. Is there anyone in this room who chose their place of birth? No. No. Is there anyone who chooses their date of death? No. Anyone who chooses their place of death? No. So you don't know when you're coming and when you're going. Someone somewhere has made that decision for you. And you look at yourself in the mirror and you say, who am I? Who made me? Why did he make me? Why did he put me in Trinidad? Why not in Somalia? Why not in Australia? It wasn't a coincidence. Everything has a design. But we've stopped thinking. We don't want to think. We're not interested. We just want to pay the bills. No, we don't. Don't pretend that's, that's what you want to do. You want to pay the bills. You want to increase your social status, your class, your comfort, your luxury in life. And the more luxury you have, you never say, that's it, you want more, and you want more, and it never ends. So what are we actually really doing here? Are we just simply performing a ritual? But is there greater meaning to this? You see, to add meaning to something, you, know, you need to know who you are, where you came from, and where you're actually going. I often ask people, what is their date of birth? And they suddenly respond, but we, in our existence on this earth, have two dates of birth. One date of birth is the day that we were born from the womb of our mother. That's our physical date of birth. There's another date of birth, because our we don't consist just of body, we consist of soul. So our body was born on the day we came out of the womb of our mother. But then there's the spirit, the ruinous, the soul, that was born thousands and millions of years ago through the loins of our father, Adam a.s. That existence we've totally forgot, we don't even want to think about. And yet in that existence, we conducted ourselves in a manner that we don't even reflect. So, what have you come here today for? What is the object of this gathering? What do you do here? Remember? Remember? Is that right? I need to hear from you. Is that right? Yeah. You've come to remember who? I don't know this gentleman. But if he says to me this now, do you remember me? I'm going to look at him and say, Me? Remember you? I've never seen you before. 
I'm not seeing you for one So if you tell me, what am I going to say to you? That is, I'm not seeing you for Who are you? He was going to say, remember. He was say again, remember. And then you, if I have met him, maybe somewhere in the crowd, he'll say, oh, I remember in Hajj we met and there was a crowd. And I'm going to say, oh, yeah. So what's the object of my remembering? To find something that you've lost, right? Or you forgot. You only remember something if you forgot it. Allah says, Uzkurullah Zikr al Remember Allah a lot. Why? Because you forgot Him. How have you forgot Allah? Because you knew Allah once. Every one of us in this room, we knew Allah once. You know how? The Quran educates us. When Allah took us out the loins of Adam alayhi salam, as soon as he did that, he asked us, Alastu bi rabbikum? And there we didn't say, excuse me, I didn't know you. Who are you? We didn't have a degree from university at that time. We didn't have any qualifications. We didn't know any language. Allah spoke to us. We spontaneously responded. So we know who Allah is. We heard him. We understood him. We knew who he was. And we said, Qalu bala. We said, bala. But now we forgot him. So that's why he says, remember me, remember me, remember me. And the real objective of zikr is to find that which you have lost. So we have lost that relationship with Allah because of our involvement in the dunya. But Allah says, remember me, remember me, remember me. And the people of Allah who truly remember him, not just to count 20 times, 50 times, not for that purpose. But the people who truly remember Allah, they ultimately find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you haven't found Allah, then your objective is not fulfilled. That's why if you can't find the Prime Minister of Trinidad, you don't have reach, then try to find one of his friends. Because his friend will introduce you to him. You may go to the office 20 times and he may not meet you. You cannot find him. But if you meet one of his friends, his friends will say, yeah, I know him. Allah's best friends were Anbiya alayhi salam. And when Anbiya alayhi salam left this earth, Allah populated this earth with the awliya. And those awliya know him. They interact with him. And they have a relationship with him. But we have lost that plight, that uh, thirst to even go down that line. For us, it's all about simply pressing the button or passing the beads. And the angel just clocks. He read it 20 times today, even though he was thinking about something else. So for us, worship has become ritualistic. And we don't appreciate where we're actually going. But what I wanted to really talk to you about today is this. If you really want to know who you are uh, or what you're doing here, let's look at our journey. Allah says in the Quran, كَيْفُ تَكْفُرُونَ بِاللَّهِ وَكُنْتُمْ أَمْوَاتًا You were first dead. You think you're going to die. Allah says you've already died. As in you've already undergone a process of death. كُنْتُمْ أَنْوَاتًا فَأَحْيَاكُمْ And then he gave you life, what we're now experiencing now. ثُمَّ يُمِيتُكُمْ Then you'll die again. Two deaths. You thought one was bad. We've got another one coming. And then ثُمَّ يُحْيِيكُمْ Then he'll give you life again. But what is death? For us, death is when you go to the graveyard, bury the person, finish, gone. No more connection. But no. Death is not the opposite of life. Death is simply the transmission of one form of life into another form of life. Allah. It is life nevertheless. So, for example, Allah says in the Quran, Kullu nafsin zaiqatul maut. Every nafs will, what? Uh, not die, taste. <laughs> Taste. I just had a sweet in my mouth. I tasted it, but now the sweet is gone. 
The taste is gone. Now my mouth is the way it was before. So death is a transitory phase. And what happens after death is life again. But we're not interested. You know why? As long as we're as far as we're concerned, don't know, don't care. But if you're gonna to go to on holiday to England, you know what you'll do? What's the first thing you'll do if you're gonna to go tomorrow morning on holiday? What will you do? Pack your bags. <laughs> will anyone go to England without packing his bags? You say it's stupid, you're going from Trinidad to England. At least wear some warm clothes. It's cold in England. There you have to pay for the AC. There we have free of free of charge AC. Yeah, free of charge. You don't have to pay for it. So they say, for goodness sake, at least take some clothes. You're gonna to go to England. How mad are you? You're not packing your clothes, you're gonna wear Trinidad clothes? You're gonna to freeze to death there. So when you go on a journey, you prepare for your journey. Which one of us is going to stay on this earth? We're all going to go, but we're not really interested on the next life. Why? Because as far as we're concerned, there's only doom and gloom there. But no, it's a credible existence. And the Prophet ﷺ educated us about that existence. They are, it is not just an existence of no consequence, it is a meaningful existence. That is why I just want to relate one of these and we'll examine one of these and we'll finish there. The Prophet ﷺ one day walked past a grave. Walk past a? Let me hear the people from the back saying, walk past that? See, I can't see you this far, even though I've got glasses and you could be sleeping as far as I was concerned. So if I hear you, then I can know you're still awake. Uh, what did he walk past? Grave. Grave. Grave, as you say, grave. <laughs> Grave, brother. He walked past the grave. Does that make sense now? You're right. Okay, fair enough. So he walked past the grave. Why? Because it was the sunnah of the Prophet to visit graves. We can't speak Pashwa, you know. He walked past the grave. Why? Because he commanded his ummatis. I used to prohibit you from visiting graves, but from today I command you to visit graves. Why? For a ritual? No. To continue your relationship with the people of the graves. Hmm? To continue your relationship. That's why when he went to the grave, the hadith is a very famous hadith in Bukhari, Muslim, other Muhaddisi have written this. He looked at the grave. Now when you look at a grave, what do you see? Bricks, mortar, dirt. But when Rasulullah looked at the grave, he said, Oh my companions, these people in their graves are receiving punishment. And then the hadith carries on. I'm sure you've heard this hadith. I just want to analyze it for you. Then he got a twig branch, divided into two, put one on one grave and one on the other grave. And not only did he say they're receiving punishment, but he also said why they're receiving punishment. You know why? One used to... He couldn't control his gob. Do you use the word gob in your language? Mouth. It's a slang English term. Gob. He couldn't control his mouth. He used to slander. He used to backbite. And because of that, he was being punished in his grave. And the other person, he was being punished because he did not cater for purity from urine. And so for these two reasons, he was being tortured in his grave. They were being tortured in their grave. So the Prophet ﷺ observed, uh, observed this, and he got two twigs, and he put one twig on one grave and one in another grave, and he said, as long as these twigs remain on this, these graves, Allah will reduce the punishment of these people in their grave. Now you've heard this hadith before many times, but let's just analyze this hadith. Let's see what this hadith actually is teaching us. Number one, the Prophet goes to a grave. 
So going to the grave is the sunnah of? Number one. Number two, he's going to the grave, or as some people simply, because there's a hadith, he's going to the grave and remembers death. Yes, but that's not the only object of going to a grave. The Prophet ﷺ went to a grave and he started talking about the people of the grave. And he said, Oh my Sahaba, these people are receiving punishment. Who are these people? Who are these people? They are receiving punishment. They are Ummatis of the Prophet. ﷺ. He said they are receiving. You look at a grave and all you see is dirt. But when Rasulullah sees a grave, he doesn't see the dirt, he sees the people of the grave. Can you see the x-ray power of the eyes of Rasulullah X-ray power. And people have the audacity to say that he's a human like us? Huh? They say that he can't see behind the wall? How stupid is that? Isa salam says, What would not be I can see what you eat in your stomachs. I can see. I have x ray vision that I can see in your stomachs. And the food that you've got stored in your house, I can see from my naked eye that food. If this is not x ray vision, ultrasound vision, then what else is ultrasound and x ray vision? But Rasulullah is Imam al Anbiya. His power is greater than all the Anbiya put together. He said, Oh my Sahaba, I'm not telling you because I need Jibreel to tell me. My eye has the ability to see that which you cannot see with your eye. Don't compare my eye to your eye. My eye is superior. My father's eye, my Jad Ibrahim his eye could see Kadalika Nuri Ibrahim Madakutu Samawati Wal Al. He could see the kingdoms of the heavens and the earth. But Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's eyes are even greater. Why? Because they saw with their eyes. They saw with their eyes. They saw with their eyes. But Muhammad Rasulullah doesn't even need eyes to see. Why? His vision transcends beyond the eye. That is why when he was standing in Salah, Imam Bukhari, Imam Muslim narrates this hadith, that he turned around after Salah and he said to his companion, Oh my companion, Allah, Tuhsin Salatak, you haven't read your Namaz properly. If your Imam did that, what would you think? Then maybe he watched the CCTV cameras? And <laughs> they won't come again. If you say, you didn't read your Allah's book, you say, Imam, so how did you see my salah? The Prophet said, Allah, to send salah, you didn't read your Allah's read it again. He read, he read it again. And then he said, Wallahi, I swear, La yakhfa alayya khushu'ukum wa la khudu'ukum, or in the words of Imam Bukhari, wa la khushu'ukum wa la ruku'ukum. Inni la arakum min warai zahri. He said, I swear by Allah, your internal state and your external state is not hidden from Muhammad Rasulullah. Everyone says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then he said, It's not because it's hidden because Jibreel tells me, No. Inni la arakum min warai. I look at you behind me in the same way I look at you in front of me. So other Anbiya needed eyes to look. But Muhammad Rasulullah doesn't even need his eyes. Allah has given him panoramic vision even behind him as though it is in front of him. So the Sahaba knew this. So when he said they are receiving punishment, they knew that he could see inside the grave. Number one. You see how we established that? You see how we did the part of this? We extracted principle from this? Number one. Number two. Let's carry on. He said, Oh my Sahaba, they are receiving punishment for X and for Y. What does that tell you? 
Nabi doesn't only see, he has knowledge of his ummatis in his grave. He doesn't just see, he has knowledge. He has knowledge of their amal, of their actions. They were just receiving punishment. They were just receiving punishment. But he didn't just see them receiving punishment, he knew the cause of that punishment. So the Nabi knows the Nama Amal, the Amal, the deeds of his Ummatis. Can you imagine the power of a Nabi? That he knows every single Amal that we do? And he said, these are the Amals that are the base of Azar. Anyway, carry on. Then he, what did he do? He got a twig. Where was that twig from? Jannah? Where was it from? It. Nearby. It's just an ordinary twig. He got a twig and he put it on the grave. He broke it into two. One on one grave, one on? Why? Why put a twig? And he said as long as these twigs remain alive, Who determines life and death? A twig which has come off the tree, science says it's dead. But Rasulullah is the Nabi and he knows what is dead and what is alive. Huh? He knows what is dead and what is? Because he's not uh, just a Nabi for humans. He said, Ursiltu ilal khalki kafa. Allah sent me as a Rasul to all of creation. So he is a Nabi of even plants. He knows when a plant is dead or alive. He says, I'll say, how about this twig? He takes it into two. He says it's still alive. As long as it will remain alive, it will give benefit to the people of the grave. How can a twig give benefit to a person in his grave? What is the significance of the life of a twig and the benefit to the person of the grave? What is the relationship between the two? The relationship is, my dear brothers, that as long as it is alive, it does the tasbih and tamheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And where Allah's tasbih is being done, Allah does not implement His wrath. Akbar. Where Allah's praise is being done, Allah does not implement His punishment. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam picked up an ordinary piece of twig, broke it into two, told us that I know the life and death of a twig. But then the question arises, the twig was nearby. He could have just said, Oh Allah, make the tasbih of that twig go to these people. No. He physically got the twig, put one on one grave and one on another grave. What is Nabi teaching us? He is saying the twig was doing tasbih there, but that tasbih was not attributable to these people. Now that it's on its grave, it has a direct link with the person of the grave. Therefore, why did he put it on the grave? To make the grave a better place. To make it a more peaceful place. To make it a more sacred place. To make it a more sanctified place. So therefore we can see it is the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to make a grave sacred, sacred, uh, as, 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 uh, sacred uh, uh, and to make it more sanctified and to make it more peaceful. This is the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to decorate a grave. What better way to decorate a grave than to decorate it with the tasbih of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And those people who say, oh, when someone dies, just leave the grave, just go away. No, this is not the way of Rasulullah The way is, don't forget your brother, because he may be in punishment. Help him. Why? If I, Rasulullah am helping the people of the grave, then you must also help your brothers in their graves. And how do you help your brothers in your grave? I put a twig, and as long as the twig does the speed, it will benefit the person of the grave. Ladies and gentlemen, if the, the speed 
on the tamheed, the praise of a twig can benefit the person of the grave, then why can't the tasbih, tamheed, and praise of a human being benefit the person of the grave? But nowadays, it's all about finish, dead, gone, bury him, finish him. No more relationship with us. He's gone. But those people who don't pray after the deceased, don't blame them. They are right. Those people who don't pray, don't blame them. They are 100% right when they say we shouldn't pray. Why? Because Allah has instructed us to pray and instructed them not to pray. You know why? Allah says in the Quran, look Allah says, this is not uh, 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 me just making something up. Allah says in the Quran about munafiqeen. About who? Munafiqeen. About who? Munafiqeen. Munafiqeen. Allah says to his Rasul, Ya Rasulullah, La tusalli ala ahadim minhum mata abadan. Ya Rasulullah, if these bloody munafiqs die, don't <laughs> pray for them. Ever and ever, these bloody munafiqs, let them come in their graves. I will deal with them. La tusalli ala ahadim minhum, minhum when they die. Not when your people die. When your people die, you pray, carry on praying. But when they die, don't pray. That is why when our mayyat is in front of us, we pray. When their mayyat is in front, they know it's not, it's minimum from amongst them. So therefore, they don't pray because they know it's from amongst them. But we are sure that our mayyat is not from amongst minimum. That's why we pray. See, so they are right also. When they don't pray, you say, mashallah, thank you very much. You identified. Huh? But we are sure that our mayyat is right because we are commanded by Allah's Rasul to pray and we pray. If the prayer of a twig can benefit the person in the grave, then the prayer of a human being is greater than the prayer of a twig. Which is greater? The prayer of a human or the prayer of a, prayer of a twig? Yeah, Why? Because humans have a choice to pray to Allah. Twig has no choice. Then when you exercise your choice and pray to Allah, Allah says to his angels, Oh my angels, look, he could have been relaxing tonight. He could have been doing this tonight. He could have been socializing tonight. But angels, he chose to remember me. He chose to praise me. Go, bear witness, I have forgiven all of his sins. And we say, oh Allah, we praise you because we want you to forgive our sins and the sins of the person in the grave. So Rasulullah taught us that decorate graves with the tasbih and the tamheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and carry on that relationship. If I, your Nabi, have catered for Isa al-Sawab, for the person who's passed away, then you should carry on that process. Because carrying on that process of benefiting the people of the grave is the sunnah of Rasulullah. <laughs> Therefore, carry on that relationship. When you carry on that relationship, it doesn't mean that now that's it. When they've gone, they're dead. No, this is the way of the kuffar. That when they bury their dead, they don't want to see them anymore. Because Allah says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu. Oh, you who believe, he's talking to every one of you. Don't make friends with the people who Allah has been, uh, 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 has inflicted his azab, his punishment on. Why? They are disillusioned from the hereafter. The way the kafirs are disillusioned from the people of the graves. The Ahl Sunnah are not disillusioned from the people of the graves. They know that we give them benefit and they give. We give them benefit and they give. How do they give us benefit? How is it possible that they give us benefit? I will leave this for another time and another day. Because if I carry on, I can see you already sleepy.
and you'll, be, you'll start snoring soon. No. So, another time, how do the people of the graves actually help us? Inshallah, I'll show you this from another, in another time. Of course, you have a very qualified uh, 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 alim who is uh, with you 24 hours of the day here. Uh, you have also a mom like her. But if life permits and I come back to the shores of your beautiful country, then we'll talk on the subject more. But the conclusion of my lecture is this. Don't limit your life to here. Don't prepare your life of the hereafter by simply being petrified by it. <laughs> Why? Because if you are going to be simply petrified by it, you won't prepare for it. You won't know what to do for it. You need to understand that there is life beyond this life. And it's a real life. It's a credible life. It's a meaningful life. It's a sustainable life. It's a life which has meaning not only in the Akhirah, but it also has meaning in this. How does life in the grave have meaning in this dunya? The Prophet said, sit on burning coal. Sit on? Would anyone like to sit on burning coal? Oh my God, I'm getting really worried here. <laughs> You know what masochism is, don't you? <laughs> Self-harm. Anyone want to sit on coal? No. Right then. I should learn the Trinidad accent, you know, then I think I'm going to get through more. Maybe it's this English accent I'm not getting through. Yeah. Uh, anyone like to sit on burning coal? No. no. Right the Prophet said, you would rather sit on burning coal, but don't sit on a grave. Why? Because by sitting on a grave, you will cause pain to the person of that. Right. So it means that even though his body may be disintegrated in the grave, but he still has a relationship with the. His ruh is in the. His DNA is in the. Don't undermine it. If this is the status of the ordinary person, then the awliya and ambiya, their bodies are preserved in their graves. May Allah allow us the opportunity to begin to instigate a process of understanding our deen and making the most of this life rather than simply being machines where we switch on in the morning and switch off at night. May Allah give us more meaning and substance to our life. O ma alayna illa bilahu al-muhim. Tabir! 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 Let me say Jazakallah Khair Fahm